the National Press Club 2021 Australian of the Year, Grace Tame. An outspoken advocate for survivors of sexual assault, Grace Tame has used her own experience to campaign for legal reforms and greater public awareness. Grace Tame with today's Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club for today's Westpac Address. My name is Emma MacDonald and I am the Associate Editor of Her Canberra and I am the Convener of Women in Media Canberra. Today's address is the Press Club's contribution to International Women's Day, perhaps a little early but we always like to set the agenda. Um, it's with enormous pride that I introduce Grace Tame. She is this year's Australian of the Year, an outspoken advocate for survivors of sexual assault and a woman who has shifted the paradigm on how we discuss grooming, consent and abuse. Uh, perhaps there has never been a more important time to listen to what Grace has to say. If you are following the conversation online, please use the handle at Press Club Ost um, and our hashtag is NPC. Please welcome Grace Tame. In April of 2010, I was battling severe anorexia. Truth be told, I still am. This illness had nearly taken my life the year prior and seen me hospitalised twice, bedridden and tube fed. Bone thin and covered in fine down hairs from malnourishment, I was picked on for the way that I looked. I'd just stopped living with my father for the first time since I was born and my mother was eight months pregnant at 45. I was a 15-year-old student at a private girls' school in Hobart. One morning after an outpatient checkup, I arrived late to discover the rest of my Year 10 classmates were attending a driving lesson off campus that I'd completely forgotten about. Lapses like these weren't uncommon at this time. I was barely there. One of the senior teachers noticed me walking around aimlessly in the courtyard. He was well-respected, the head of maths and science, at the school for nearly 20 years. He taught me in year nine. I thought he was funny. He told me he had a free period and asked if I'd come and chat with him in his office. He asked me about my illness. I talked, he listened. He promised to help me, to guide me in my recovery. As a teenager with no frame of reference and therefore thinking nothing odd of this, I told my mother about our conversation when I came home that day. My parents had a meeting with the school principal soon after, requesting that this teacher stay away from me. But in the meeting that I then had with the school principal and this senior teacher, I remember having to apologise. I had to apologise to him for putting him in this position, in front of the principal. I was told I had done something wrong. Baffled though I was, I believed I had. Thus, the first seeds of terror, confusion and self-doubt had been sown in my mind. Indeed, it didn't make sense. In secret, he was adamant that I still come to see him, to talk. My parents were against me, he insisted. I was not to tell them because they simply wouldn't understand. Pregnant women, he said, were full of hormones. That must have been why my mother and I were arguing. He gave me a key to his office where there was always music playing and it was always the same music, Simon and Garfunkel. Over a period of months, he built my trust to a point where I felt safe sharing my fears and past trauma that underpinned my illness, like my experience of being sexually abused as a six-year-old by an older child who told me to undress in a closet before molesting me. He told me he would never hurt me, until he did by way of a masterful reenactment I didn't see coming, with a closet and an instruction to undress. Most of you know my story from there. That is, how I lost my virginity to a 58-year-old pedophile and spent the next six months being raped by him at school nearly every day on the floor of his office. When I finally reported him to police, they found 28 multimedia files of child pornography on his computer. But as per the lasting impact and in of intense and manipulative grooming, and a mere four months after the abuse, I effectively defended him in my statement. 
Still only 16 then, I was terrified he would find out that I had betrayed him and that he would kill me. He was sentenced to two years and 10 months in jail for maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17. Repairing myself in the aftermath of all this was certainly not a simple linear undertaking. For every step forward, there were steps back to the side and some almost off the edge. I saw counselor after counselor, but I also abused drugs, drank, moved overseas, cut myself, threw myself into study, dyed my hair, made amazing friendships, got ugly tattoos, worked for my childhood hero, found myself in violent relationships, practiced yoga, even became a yoga teacher. I starved, I binged, and I starved again. One of the toughest challenges on my road to recovery was trying to speak about something we are taught is unspeakable. I felt completely disconnected from myself and everyone around me. Many people didn't know how to respond. That said, the ones who listened, the ones who were eager to understand even when they couldn't, made all the difference. Still, the doubt lingered. How could I have been so stupid as to not see what this man was doing from the outset? Was it my fault? Should I have known it was a lie when he said that he learned more from me than any of his other students? Maybe I should have been more alarmed when he asked me if I knew where my clitoris was and then laughed at me when I said no. It was when the perpetrator was released after serving only 19 months for abusing me almost every day, correction, maintaining a sexual relationship with me as a 15 year old, and then spoke freely on Facebook and to the media about how awesome and enviable it was, that I realized we had this all around the wrong way. Add the fact that this man was awarded a federally funded PhD scholarship to the only university in my home state while my mother was studying there. My mother, who hadn't had the opportunity to do so growing up. She soon dropped out because of his presence, but he remained. In fact, he was put into student accommodation with fresh 17 and 18 year old and graduates. And despite multiple reports to police by fellow students of his predatory behavior, and despite once again being convicted and jailed for his vulgar public comments during his PhD tenure, he was eventually awarded a doctorate. After all this, it became quite obvious to me why child sexual abuse remains ubiquitous in our society. Because while predators retain the power to get exactly what they want, to feign remorse and to objectify their targets through free speech, the innocent, survivors and bystanders alike, are burdened by shame-induced silence. In 2017, I connected with groundbreaking freelance journalist and fellow survivor, my dear friend, Nina Fennell. I felt I needed to share my story publicly under my own name to raise awareness and educate others about sexual abuse and the prolonged psychological manipulation that belies it. Yet, after months of recounting, re-traumatizing details, tirelessly transposed by Nina, we discovered we were barred from sharing them by Section 194K of Tasmania's Evidence Act, which made it illegal for survivors of child sexual abuse to be identified in the media, even after turning 18, even with their consent. Using my case as the foundation, Nina created the Let Her Speak campaign to reform this law. We were then joined by 16 other brave survivors who lent their stories to the cause. The law was officially changed in April last year, almost 10 years to the day from the beginning of my story. It is so important for our nation, the whole world in fact, to listen to survivors' stories. Whilst they are disturbing to hear, the reality of what goes on behind closed doors is more so. And the more details we omit for fear of disturbance, the more we soften these crimes, the more we shield perpetrators from the shame that is resultantly misdirected to their targets. When we share, we heal, reconnect and grow, both as individuals and as a united, strengthened collective. History, lived experience, the whole truth, unsanitized and unedited, is our greatest learning resource. It is what informs social and structural change. 
The upshot of allowing predators a voice but not survivors encourages the criminal behaviour. Through working with Nina, finally winning the right to speak and talking with fellow campaign survivors and countless other women and men who have since come forward, it has become clear that there is the potential to do so much more to support survivors of child sexual abuse to thrive in life beyond their trauma and more so to end child sexual abuse. It is my mission to do so and it begins right now. As a fortunate nation, we have a particular obligation to protect our most vulnerable, our innocent children, and especially those who are further disadvantaged through circumstance, being part of a minority group or geographical location. And there are three key areas that we can focus on to achieve this. Number one, how we invite, listen and accept the conversation and lived experience of child sexual abuse survivors. You've heard me say it before, it all starts with conversation. Number two, what we do to expand our understanding of this heinous crime, in particular, the grooming process through both formal and informal education. Number three, how we provide a consistent national framework that supports survivors and their loved ones, not just in their recovery, but also to disempower and deter predators from action. So what is it that we must do? First and foremost, let's keep talking about it. It's that simple. Let's start by opening up. It is up to us as a community, as a country, to create a space, a national movement, where survivors feel supported and free to share their truths. Let's drive a paradigm shift of shame away from those who have been abused and onto abusive behaviour. Let's share the platform to remind all survivors that their individual voice matters amongst the collective. Every story is imbued with unique, catalytic, educative potential that can only be told by its subject. Let us genuinely listen, actively, without judgment and without advice, to demonstrate empathy and reassure that it is and never was our fault. Further to this point, while I must express my unflinching gratitude for this newfound platform and the unique opportunities for learning and growth that come with it, I would like to take this particular opportunity to directly address the media with a constructive reminder, the need for which has become starkly apparent to me this past month. Hosts, reporters, journalists, I say to you, listening to survivors is one thing, Repeatedly expecting people to relive their trauma on your terms without our consent, without prior warning, is another. It's sensation. It's commodification of our pain. It's exploitation. It's the same abuse. Of all the many forms of trauma, rape has the highest rate of PTSD. Healing from trauma does not mean it is forgotten, nor that the symptoms will never be felt again. Trauma lives on in our cells. Our unconscious bodies are steps ahead of our conscious minds. When we are triggered, we are inevitably at the mercy of our emotional brain. In this state, it is impossible to discern between past and present. Such is re-traumatization. I cried more than once while writing this. Just because I've been recognised for my story does not mean it's fair game anywhere, anytime. It also doesn't mean it gets any easier to tell. I may be strong, yes, but I am human just like everyone else. None of us are invincible. By definition, truths cannot be forced. So grant us the respect and patience to share them on our own terms, rather than barking instructions like, take us back to your darkest moment, and tell us about being raped. The cycle of abuse cannot be broken simply by replaying case histories. We cannot afford to backtrack, else we will go round in circles, trapped in a painful narrative, and we'll all get tired, both as speakers and listeners. We'll want to switch off and give up, and retreat once more into silence. On average, it takes 23.9 years for survivors of child sexual abuse to be able to speak about their experiences. 
Such is the success of predators at instilling fear and self-doubt in the minds of their targets. More so than they are masters of destroying our trust in others, perpetrators are masters of destroying our trust in our own judgment, in ourselves. Such is the power of shame. A power, though, that is no match for love. When I disclosed my abuse to another of my teachers, Dr. William Simon, his absolute belief in me was the only assurance I needed to tell the police. It helped me recover a little of my lost faith in humanity. There certainly isn't a single rigid solution. Solutions will naturally come in due course by allowing and enabling voices to be heard. Certainly, talking about child sexual abuse won't eradicate it, but we can't fix a problem we don't discuss. And so it begins with conversation. Which brings me to my second point. From there, we need to expand the conversation to create more awareness and education, particularly around the process of grooming. Grooming. It's a concept that makes us wince and shudder, and as such, we rarely hear about it. To the benefit of perpetrators. While it haunts us and we avoid properly breaking it down, the complexity and secrecy of this criminal behavior is what predators thrive on. In turn, we enable them to charm and manipulate not just their targets, but all of us at once, family, friends, colleagues, and community members. And this must stop. Our discomfort, our fear and resulting ignorance needs to stop giving perpetrators the protection, power and confidence that allows them to operate. As a start, we should all be aware of what has been identified as the six phases of grooming, which certainly ring true in my experience. Number one, targeting. That is, identifying a vulnerable individual. In my case, I was an innocent child, but I was also anorexic with significant change happening at home. Number two, gaining trust. That is establishing a friendship and falsely lulling the target into a sense of security by empathizing and assuring safety. For me, that was what I thought was listening to my challenges, empathizing with my situation and providing me a safe space to retreat to when I needed it. Number three, Filling a need, that is, playing the person that fills the gap in a target's mental and emotional support. In my case, although I was surrounded by an incredibly attentive family and team of medical professionals, most of their support came in the form of tough love. The teacher thus assumed the role of sympathizer, telling me everything I wanted to hear. Number four, isolating, that is, driving wedges between the target and their genuine supporters. This involves pushing certain people away, but exploiting others. I remember studying the film Iron Jawed Angels that year in history. In one of the scenes, the main character is force fed, much like I had been. Aware of my distress upon seeing this, my history teacher quietly led me out of the classroom. I said nothing, but she took me straight to his office, where she left me with him, panicked in tears. It wasn't until many years later that I questioned why she and other staff would take me to him when I was upset. Staff he privately mocked and referred to as the menopausal virgins club. He must have told them. Number five, sexualizing. That is, gradually introducing sexual content so as to normalize it. In my case, in conjunction with subtly explicit conversation, I was carefully exposed to material that glorified relationships between characters with significant age differences. There was one film in particular he made me watch called The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, the last line of which is, give me a girl at an impressionable age and she is mine for life. And remember how I said Simon and Garfunkel was always playing? Their music was the soundtrack to The Graduate. He made me watch that too. And thus, both literally and figuratively, it was 
The sound of silence, haunting and unending, that underscored my experience of pedophilic abuse. You know the lyrics. The vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. Number six, maintaining control. That is, striking a perfect balance between causing pain and providing relief from that pain. To condition the target to feel guilt at the thought of exposing a person who also appears to care for them. By way of physical intimidation combined with veiled threats, abusers scare you into silent submission. At over six foot, he towered above me. He once told me a story about a friend of his who sought revenge on a woman by digging her eyes out with a spoon. He told me he'd killed people as a soldier. He'd also sit outside on my street at night in his car to watch me undress through the window. I was already embarrassed by my changing shape as a young teenager in eating disorder recovery. But I remember standing naked behind his desk after he had just raped me and asking him if, I, if he thought I was fat. He looked me up and down and said, well, you could do with some more exercise, like I was a dog. But he also told me I was beautiful. See how it is all stiflingly, painfully complex. But as we talk more about child sexual abuse, our lived experiences and what we know, our understanding of this premeditated evil will continue to develop. We need to warn our children, age appropriately, of the signs and characteristic behaviours, whilst educating how to report it should it happen to them or to those around them. This is a serious enough topic, unfortunately too common in occurrence for us to hope that kids know this. So I challenge our education system to look for ways to more formally educate our children, because we know that education is our primary means of prevention. And finally, to my third point, we need structural change, a national system that supports and protects survivors and deals with crimes in proportion to their severity. Let's start by considering the implications of linguistics related to offences. Through Let Her Speak campaign efforts, we saw the wording of my abuser's charge officially changed from maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17 to the persistent sexual abuse of a child. Now think about the difference in the crime according to the language of both of these. Think about the message it sends to the community. Think about the message it sends survivors, where empathy is placed where blame is placed, and how punishment is then given. We need to protect our children not just from the physical, mental and emotional pain of these hideous crimes, but from the long-lasting, sometimes lifelong trauma that accompanies it. Whilst national structural change is no small feat, nor is educating our children on the dangers and complexities of grooming, it is work that needs to be done and we need to start somewhere. Let's start by reviewing our linguistics and by agreeing between ourselves. In Australia, we have eight state and territory jurisdictions and eight different definitions of consent. We need to agree on something as absolute as what consent is. We need a uniform state and federal national standard and definition of consent. Only then can we effectively teach this fundamentally important principle consistently around Australia. Since I was announced as Australian of the Year just over a month ago, hundreds of fellow child sexual abuse survivors have reached out to me to tell their stories, to cry with me. Stories they thought they would take with them to the grave out of shame for being subjected to something that was not their fault stories of a kind of suffering they had previously never been able to explain, stories of grooming. I am one of the luckiest ones who survived, who was believed, who was surrounded by love. And what this shows me is that despite this problem still existing and despite a personal history of trauma that is still ongoing, it is possible to heal 
to thrive and live a wonderful life. It is my mission and my duty as a survivor and as a survivor with a voice to continue working towards eradicating child sexual abuse. I won't stop until it does. And so, I leave you with these three messages. Number one, to our government, our decision makers and our policy makers, we need reform on a national scale, both in policy and education, to address these heinous crimes so that they are no longer enabled to be perpetrated. Number two, to my nation, the wonderful people of Australia. We need to be open, to embrace the conversation, new information, and take guidance from our experiences so we can inform change, so we can heal and prevent this happening to future generations. Number three, and finally, to my fellow survivors, it is our time. We need to take this opportunity. We need to be bold and courageous. Recognise we have a platform on which I stand with you in solidarity and support. Share your truth. It is your power. One voice, your voice, and our collective voices can make a difference. We are on the precipice of a revolution whose call to action needs to be heard loud and clear. That's right, you got it. Let's keep making noise, Australia. Thank you, Grace, for that um, powerful address. Um, before we hand over two questions today, could I just request that the journalists here are very mindful of the fact that Grace cannot talk about issues that um, are related to the allegations against a minister, nor can she really talk about um, investigations that are under police investigations. So if we can just be very careful about what we're asking her, mindful also of what she said. Um, she's more than happy to talk more broadly about her work, about the contents of her address. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Laura Tingle for the first question. Grace, if you could come back up to the podium. Thanks so much, Grace. No um, worries, Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm just listening to what you're saying about, uh, you know, taking guidance. Yes. Uh, now, obviously, the issue of uh, sexual harassment and assault has been in our political debate for the last month. That's right. And uh, while I understand you can't talk about these particular cases, uh, the issue for journalists is how do we talk about this um, you know, issues of politics aside in ways that are conscious that these issues trigger people who've suffered uh, assault, uh, harassment. In, and w where's the line that we, w that we follow so that we're telling the stories, but we're not making it worse for people, uh, so that we're empowering people and not making it worse? I think um, it's about reframing the approach like I said, rather than instructing and, and demanding certain details uh, provided. It's about asking, what can we learn from what has happened to you? Not, what's happened to you? What can we learn? How can we move the conversation forward? Because like I said in the speech, there's a real concern that I have, I know, and that is that we are just going to get trapped in this narrative and, and, and people who really need to hear this message are just going to go, oh, well, I'm sick of hearing about this, all these sordid details. What, what can we actually do moving forward to prevent this? And the answer is listening to survivors and finding out the details, especially around grooming. 
um, and then applying those lessons to education models. Hi, Lisa Vicenton from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Hi, um, Lisa. Hi. It's been five weeks or so since you were announced as Australian of the Year. Since then, we've had two very public allegations of rape uh, in the political and national sphere. Um, I understand you can't go into them, but do you see these allegations as having an impact on how you will campaign throughout the rest of the year as you advocate for sexual assault survivors and their rights? And do you believe that these allegations point to a bigger sort of uh, public reckoning for people in powerful or public positions? Oh, it's not surprising to me at all. Um, Cover-up culture, the abuse of power is not unique to Parliament. So it's not necessarily these individual cases, it's the issue itself that is going to keep inspiring me to do this work. I, I was doing this work before it dominated the national stage, um, you know, and it, it is heightened right now because it's happening in the centre of our country in Parliament, but like I said, it's not unique to Parliament. It happens everywhere. from Triple J and Women in Media in Canberra. Thank you very much for your address. Hello, um, thank you. Just on a personal note, I want to say that having you speak on behalf of survivors can't be underestimated in terms of its power. I know a lot of people have contacted us just saying how powerful your speech has been for them in revealing their own story. So I just wanted to get that out of the way first. Um, I had hoped to come up here and ask you about your personal story, about your insights. But as with so many things, politics gets in the way yep. of that. Um, and I think I do need to ask you, uh, without going into specifics about some of the matters we've seen over the last fortnight particularly, again, without going into the specifics, is there anything you've seen in the last month or so that makes you hopeful that things will change? Yes. People coming forward. People finding the courage to speak out. And it's about solidarity, you know, there's nothing more empowering than empowering others. And so the more of us that come out and speak about this, the more the conversation will be normalised and the more the power will be taken away from predators and returned to where it belongs. Hello, Amy Ramakers from The Guardian. Hello, um, Amy. And thank you for sharing your story. Of course. You spoke of active listening to mm -hmm. people's stories and to survivors. And again, we all thank you very deeply for sharing yours. It makes it easier for us to share ours. Um, and I know the trauma of carrying that cape, and I know that there would be many, many women in this room. And, and men. This, and men in this room and watching this broadcast who understand that. But then we also have leadership Mm. And again, I know you can't talk about the specifics, that's very clear. We have leadership who talk about respect, protect and reflect when they hear these stories. And then we learn that one of those stories, and this is a common occurrence, was told and wasn't listened to. In fact, what we're hearing is we're hearing more from the accused and their side of the story, which can sometimes overwhelm absolutely everything. Yes, and that's where the sympathy is often placed. There and are often headlines around and you, this person loses their job, etc., etc. And it. you yourself, in your telling your story, also had to deal with that. Mm. And you have seen that person's own story amplified at times above yours. So how do we combat that when we have leadership and power and all of those other structures continuing to place one side above voice who is telling a very traumatic tale, and then we get it reduced to he said, she said. Again, we keep encouraging and empowering survivors. It's that simple. That's where we need to, to redirect our support and our sympathy, our empathy. So just on that, would you say that you've been disappointed with some of the dialogue we have heard in the last month? Not surprised, I would say. I would say not surprised. That this is a, it's a culture. <laughs> it's a culture. The next question is from the Australian. Uh, Adesh Laore from the Australian. Thank you so much for your speech, Grace. Um, I understand that you can't talk about specifics, but there has been a discussion in Parliament about an independent um, 
investigation into a politician's actions in the past. Um, and as far as we're aware, we haven't had a situation where um, there's been a non-police investigation into a politician's actions in the past. How do you believe such an inquiry could work and what do you think it, it could achieve? Admittedly, I'm not across the details of how inquiries like this work. Um, sadly, we're seeing a lot of resources put into responses to child sexual abuse. I want to see more resources put into prevention of it from happening in the first place so that we don't have to be scrambling when these things happen because they wouldn't be happening. I might just ask a question. Um, what could schools do and where do we start putting those resources in? What practically can be done? Again, I'm not across exactly how um, education frameworks work, but I think it's as simple as even informally having conversation as early as the primary level about some of the specifics about grooming, about consent, and those sorts of things. You know, it needs to be obviously tailored and age appropriate, but to have those conversations at the primary level in early um, high school as well, it starts there. It is, it's really quite simple and it, it seems to me like common sense and that's why I sometimes get stumped and feel like I'm bashing my head around <laughs> against a wall. I'm like, let's just start this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, Claire from the Adelaide Advertiser. Claire Vickers from the Adelaide Advertiser and the Hobart Mercury. Ooh! <laughs> woo -woo. Cassie! Yeah, there has been some changes in Tasmania to Section 194K. That's right. Uh, it's initial progress. Do you think there needs to be more progress? Has the initial change gone far enough? And what else would you like to see happen in Tasmania for survivors? Um, well, what I would like to see happen in Tasmania uh, for survivors is what I would like to see happen for survivors worldwide and that is just more support and this is a learning process we're all learning um, and we can always be doing better uh, I admittedly am not across all of the details of section 194k um, and so far I don't think we've seen that there hasn't been enough time that's elapsed between uh, the law actually being changed and and uh, you know now for us to, to, to really see the benefits because, like I said, it takes, on average, 23.9 years for a survivor to, to find the courage to speak up because of shame. And so it's only been less than a year. I don't know what it's going to look like in coming months, in a year from now. Um, but I think the short answer is that there's always room for improvement. Um, Tamsin from the Herald Sun. Thanks, Grace, and thanks for all your work and, and your address. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Tamsin Rose from the Herald Sun. Uh, Tamsin. Today it's been revealed that Defence Chief Angus Campbell told first year cadets not to make themselves prey to sexual predators uh, while being out late at night alone and attractive. He said they could protect themselves by avoiding the attention of predators. What's the impact of advice like this on young people? And should someone like that hold a position of power? Look, I'm not judge, jury and executioner, but those are not help that's not helpful rhetoric at all. That feeds the, the idea that, that this is something that a, a, a victim has to foresee and, and stop themselves as if they're to blame. And that is really unhelpful. <laughs> Uh, next, we have a question from a student from Canberra Grammar School. Hello, Grace. Uh, Hello. I'm Rumama Kaloon and I'm from Canberra Grammar School. Hello. As a young woman, I would like to thank you for being the voice of so many and an agent of change, providing inspiration for so many young Australians. And my question for you today is, as a young leader at my school, what can I do to support victims of sexual assault and sexual harassment and condemn the culture of silence that resides in so many institutions, such as schools? It's simple, fill that silence. Fill it with knowledge, fill it with love, fill it with support, and just, just be there. You know, it is, it's, it's hard to know exactly what to say and, and that there isn't necessarily a, a perfect response, but just an attitude of support and belief and assurance is, goes a long way. Thank you. 
Uh, we've got Jade from the ABC. Hi Grace, Jade from the ABC, thanks for Hello, your speech. Jade. As we have this national conversation, are there any misconceptions that perhaps stick out in your mind that people who haven't experienced sexual violence might hold about the experiences of those who have? Is there anything in particular that you would like to see a, a greater understanding of? There are many <laughs> misconceptions, um, but I think that those misconceptions can be um, corrected through more conversation around the psychological manipulation that underpins it. Yeah, I think that's where our knowledge is lacking. I think that we have a very um, good, or I would hope, concept of rape being bad, um, violence being bad. But when you start to throw terms around like grooming or in the domestic violence space, you would hear coercive control. That's when people switch off. Um, so it is, it's about letting survivors talk about all the other stuff that goes on besides the physical abuse. Um, because it's the psychological abuse that's the worst of it. It's the, the, that's the stuff that sticks with you, as you would have heard in my speech. It's eerie. Um, yeah, I don't know. Grace, it's uh, clear that um, many people in this room and around the nation are triggered by listening to you and it brings back um, many issues and emotions. As a, as a first call, and you obviously want people to discuss the issue, but what if someone is disclosing to you for the first time, what is something that is helpful to say? Um, nothing can make it better, but, but what can, how, do we, how do we actually take that information on board in a constructive way because it is a very big thing to disclose. Say, I hear you and I'm going to work with you on this. You know, we're in it together. Like I said, there might not be a, a, a clear, precise solution, but, but simply being in solidarity with the person and figuring it out together as we go along, that's, that's the whole point, you know. Um, it was really powerful to me when I made my speech at the um, awards ceremony, you know, looking out into the audience and seeing people crying and embracing each other. And it was like we'd been granted permission to be vulnerable again. Um, you know, we've become so disconnected, especially in the Western world. Um, I, I think some people are, are wor like politically worried. Correct. Like, what worried. do they say? Yeah, it's it's such it's such a tricky. Well, um, you can topic. you can say, oh, look, I don't know what to say, you know. But we're all human beings at the end of the day, and we will make mistakes in the conversation. And that's that's okay. Um, the the idea is not to disproportionately beat ourselves or each other up over it and uh, you know, point fingers and say, well, you could have responded better or whatever. It's about how can we move, always be moving forward. Do you think, sorry to hog the microphone, do you think that the, um, the issues of the last few weeks relating to Brittany Higgins, where she has left her job, do you think it reinforces the, um, I guess, the fear that maybe disclosure will lead to um, you know, repercussions in personal and, and um, career life? Yes, but the fact is there will be repercussions. Um, it's about, yeah, it's about changing, changing the conversation, like I've said, um, and realising that um, you can actually keep functioning as a survivor and you can keep your job um, and that shouldn't be something that you have to worry about as a, as a survivor. Hmm. I wonder though whether, whether the last few weeks has maybe shown a darker side to, uh, you know, to, to, to coming out with, with these issues. Hmm. Well, we have to change that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, um, there's no shame there. That's not where the shame sits. Yeah. The next question is Naveen from SBS. Yeah, Naveen Razik from SBS, thank you for your really engaging, powerful speech. I just want to go to the issue of rhetoric that we touched on with uh, Angus Houston. When the Prime Minister responded to these first set of allegations, he used the phrase, as a father, um, and he said he had to have a chat with his wife, Jenny, before he was able to, you know, front the media and speak. What do you make of that and what do you make of the rhetoric and the way he's handled those allegations? It shouldn't take having children to have a conscience.
and actually on top of that having children doesn't guarantee a conscience just a supplement <laughs> Just one more quick one on that. Um, in May in 2019, he said that he hopes that he, um, in a sense, that survive, he could create an atmosphere where survivors could be believed. He said it was really important that survivors have the confidence when they come forward that they would be believed. Do you think those words ring true now in the way he's handled that? Clearly not. <laughs> Andrew Tillett from the AFR. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Grace. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review and a, a director here at the National Press Club. Um, going to your speech, and you talked about sort of changing, I guess, the, 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 the need to change the rhetoric, the national sort of nationally consistent framework. Um, does that include things also around sort of sentencing? Yes. Perpetrators. The situation, you, you, your, your abuser only got less than three years in jail. Less than that. But, yeah, yeah, less but, than that. Two years, um, ten months. You have a situation where, and I don't want to get all Old Testament, an eye for an eye sort of thing, but, you know, we, 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 we seem to think that, you know, you kill someone, life in jail is sort of, we don't bat an eyelid at that sort of sentence, sort of thing like that. But when it comes to, to sex crimes, it's very much on the low end of the scale, even though there are potential judges can give bigger penalties. Is it a case that we need to maybe have, you know, even longer penalties in light of the recognition, you mentioned the lifelong trauma that people can suffer and, and carry for, for this? Is it a matter of longer penalties or maybe changing the culture within the judiciary to actually use the, the existing laws as they are and to say, hey, you've done this, you're going to jail for 15 years and, mm -hmm. and we won't see you again? Yeah, I think both. Time. Yeah, I think that and I think that we the more that we do focus on the um, the real darkness of the crimes, the, the psychological manipulation and we allow survivors the, the um, you know, support to be able to talk about these things because it, it is kind of icky and it does take a while. Um, it takes a long time to understand in your own mind, let alone actually sort of undo and then speak about. But the more we do focus on that, I think the better we'll be able to inform, um, you know, legislation in, in relation to punishment of, of sex crimes. Um, is, a, is it a change though that, you know, is the, the bench just dominated by old, stale, pale males? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, Grace, is there a role for the Prime Minister to look at not only standards of crimes relating to um, child sexual abuse and sexual abuse, but also, um, I guess, um, definitions as well as um, penalties? Most, most certainly, yes. What could he reasonably do? Look, I don't know the specifics, but I think there needs to be a lot of review of legislation in general that pertains to sexual abuse and particularly child sexual abuse. And you feel that national legislation national has more legislation. power than feds and state Yeah, government. look, I, I understand. Um, first of all, I'm not a lawyer and I don't have any background there, so I admittedly am not across all the details, but you know, I understand the need for um, you know, discretion when you've got uh, legislation that pertains to geographical location and infrastructure and, and whatever have you. But when it comes to things like, you know, human rights issues like child sexual abuse, having eight different, different definitions of things or eight different responses to things is unhelpful, not necessarily because one is better than the other, but it's because there are eight. Yeah. And when there's that kind of ambiguity and inconsistency, you can't educate properly. And I guess this is um, a kind of a silly question to ask, but do you think penalties should be harsher? That's not a silly question, but yes. <laughs> um, Tom from Sky News. Hi, Grace. Tom Connell from Sky News. Thanks for such a, a powerful speech. Thank you, um, Tom. I wanted to ask you about grooming. So you, you've talked about how much of a crucial role it plays in child sex abuse happening. It's such a serious accusation to make. I wonder if some people within a school environment are afraid to make it in case it's wrong. D yes. d is there something needed, perhaps an automatic trigger? You can have a list of behaviour that you can say, well, this behaviour is happening in isolation with a student. 
there has to be some sort of grooming investigation so people feel like they can say, I'm just following this recommendation. Yes. I'm not trying to offend you because otherwise perhaps people are just too afraid to make that accusation? Yes, I agree with that 100%. And, and that's part of the problem, you know. Um, people wonder why predators are so successful and, and one of the reasons is because they are more threatening than the threat of law or policy to a lot of people, to bystanders who often stand up to them but are then threatened themselves by by predators. Our next question is David Crow from the uh, Sydney Morning Herald and Aid. I thank know, you. David. Thanks very much. David. And thank you, Grace, for a really uh, unforgettable speech. Also, congratulations on the Australian of the Year Award. I wanted to mention that award and some of the aftermath of that in my question. You finished your speech talking about three things, about uh, the need for reform, and that was a message targeted at government, about the community and that message about having the conversation and that message you had to survive is about being bold and courageous. I wanted to ask about the first thing, since we are here in Canberra. Mm. You're Australian of the Year. You have a very small unit behind you to support you. Um, and that unit is funded by government. And you have a message to government about what it should do, about the reforms that it should undertake. Is there any structure yet to the role you've got and your ability to inform the government or even to have conversations with government about what it does. You had a very pointed remark about Scott Morrison earlier. Are you getting any sign that you have any input into his thinking or his government's thinking on these really fundamental questions? We're working it out. <laughs> We're making it up as we go along. No, I have been very supported and we're still figuring those things out. Yeah. Do you think that you, well, can I ask, is it, are you, is it being worked out in a, in a way that's at all positive for you at the moment? In terms yes, of it's extremely positive. Yeah, I'm very hopeful. This is a wonderful opportunity for which I am eternally grateful. And we are, we're all doing it together. You said a small unit, but I actually don't think in those terms, I don't think of a small unit. I think I'm surrounded by a, a beautiful nation full of people who have each other's backs, and that's incredible. Thanks. Our next question is by Virginia Hausiger from the University of Canberra. Thank you. Grace, Virginia Hausiger, the host of Broad Talk and the founding director of the 5050 by 2030 Foundation from the University of Canberra. My colleagues are here. Thank you. That was, once again, an amazing, powerful speech. And it comes at a time when there is so much anger in this place mm. yes. among women and men. Yes. Anger about a lack of values-driven leadership uh, and among other things. But the problem with our anger is that often it means we don't get heard. Yes. And you spoke a lot about silence, and I want to bring you back to that. Um, and we are in danger as angry, angry women, in particular, of, of being smudged out. Now, you obviously found your voice yeah. somewhere along the way, and an incredible voice it is too, and we're very lucky to have it. But I've got to say, I was in the audience at the awards speech, and when you spoke, my mouth was on the ground. I felt so nervous for you. What Your story is so hard for a lot of people to hear, mm. and yet it's so critically important. What is your message to those who don't want to hear your story because it is too hard for them, it's too upsetting, it's too confronting? What, what do you say to them? Do you know what's more confronting than hearing about it? going through it. There's a lot of things in this world that are ugly and dark, but we have to remember that we're all human beings and that ugliness and darkness is, is unfortunately important because it helps inform how we move into the light. Can I just, I'm just in the, in the tradition of the press club, ask a double barrel <laughs> question here? Going back to your own voice, how did you find your voice? You, again, because you spoke so much about silence. At what point, and I don't mean in, this, in your, the detail of your story, but what happened such that you found that strength within you? Um, 
like I said in my speech, I'm, I'm very lucky in that I've always been surrounded by love. I've got a beautiful family and friends um, and that's, you know, that unconditional love has been my strength and will always be my strength. Um, but I actually, I suppose, found my, my voice out of anger as well. Um, a very necessary anger um, that helped overcome my fear. Um, I, uh, four days before I reported this man to police. Now I had been, uh, up until this point, submissive uh, and not really shown um, any resistance because as a survivor you learn that showing resistance will only lead to more pain. Um, I'd, I'd been silent and then a, a sort of strange thing happened where my anger surpassed my fear and terror of this man because I knew that I wasn't his first victim and I have always been motivated by a want to protect other people and to help and to educate. Um, and I realised that I had the potential to stop this thing in its tracks. And I confronted him in his office. The last words I ever spoke to him were, I think you're a monster and I hate you for what you have done to me and for what you have done to my family and for what you have done to your family. And then I reported him to police. Thank you. Thank you. We now have Sally Pryor from the Canberra Times. Hi, Grace. Hi, Sally. I just want to let you know, firstly, uh, when I heard that you were named Australian of the Year, I felt a great sense of forward momentum. Yes. It's been a horrible few weeks in politics. It's been awful. The news, it's just some of us might be forgiven for feeling like things are going backwards just as they're going forwards. We had the story on the front page today about the Chief of the Defence Force telling women to be careful so they don't become prey. I mean, how are you, you're, you're a month into, just over a month into this role of yours, this really important role. This is going to go on and on and on. I just feel like this is never ending. How are you going to cope with this? How are you going to feel like you're making a difference when these stories just never stop? You're always making a difference. It's a slow process. Change is a push-pull thing. It's very pendulous. You know, you swing this way and swing that way. But that's life as, as well, you know. Um, you just have to, I suppose, ride it out, but l lean into the love that's around you and, um, yeah. Great, so we're almost at the end of the questions. I wanted to ask, what is, what is your future um, after this year? I know you've just started and we want to uh, give you some space to make this role your own and you've started with so much um, energy and compassion and we're very grateful. But, you know, would you think of politics or representation? No! <laughs> Our next question is, um, I had to ask, um, our next question is Andrew Green from the ABC. There may be some disappointed political parties. Um, Grace, <laughs> if I can return to the CDF's comments, you said they weren't helpful. What mm. would you like to hear from the CDF at the next graduation ceremony? What would be helpful? I don't know, anything other than that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, a question from Karen Middleton, who's also on the uh, Women in Media Canberra Committee and is with the ABC. Hello Grace, thanks for your address and thanks for your advocacy. You've spoken about consent mm. and you've spoken uh, about the need for consistency and it, there's really no surprise given the eight different jurisdictions that we are... Um, uh, we're seeing some confusion among young people about consent. In parallel to the debate we're having in politics about sexual assault and harassment, we're seeing one in among schools, particularly private schools in Sydney, uh, involving children. I wonder what role you think schools should play, what role the national curriculum should play in educating children directly on that issue. It's a controversial issue for many parents who feel that it's the domain of the family home and not the domain of the school, but your assault occurred at school. Mm. What role is there for school and for the education system in directly educating children at a young age about these kinds of issues? 
Well, I think um, a way perhaps for it to be, um, for it to avoid controversy um, is for the principle of consent to be taught in schools in other ways um, because it, it's, it's about really um, equally enjoying an experience. I think um, I've never understood why or how somebody could be enjoying something that's not um, being enjoyed by the other other person. So it's as simple as, you know, introducing that principle when you're playing a board game. If somebody's not, they don't want to play, you know, don't make them play. Don't make somebody do something that they don't want to do. What happened to vicarious joy? You know, you get happiness from you know, doing something that everyone's enjoying. So maybe, maybe there are ways around that, especially at the primary level, but I'd, I, I, I don't know how exactly to tackle it in, in schools, but just simply having the conversation um, in some way, I think is important. And our final question, I believe, is Annabelle from the West Australian. Um, Annabelle Hennessy here from the West Australian. Thank you so much for your speech, Grace, and congratulations um, on Australian the Year. I can't think of anyone more deserving. Um, mm. My question is simply, um, for other survivors who are thinking of doing similar to what you have in going public with their stories, what would you tell them to consider beforehand or what would, you, what would your advice to them be in weighing up that decision? Remember that you have the power and that you have the control. It's your voice, it's your story, and nobody else can tell it, and they can't tell you how to tell it. Thank you so much, Grace. I can't recall ever sitting up here and seeing more um, shocked and in awe and emotional faces so it's um it's been a big it's been a big day for many of us um it's with pleasure that i can give you a national press club membership so whenever you're in canberra <laughs> you can come back we'll all be a lot calmer i'm hoping um but thank you for everything that you've done and we wish you all the best for the coming year thank, thank you thank you thank you